This is Tracy Drummond. I'm here today with Joseph Hawkins in uh, Fort Washington, Maryland to conduct an interview with him. It is Monday the 15th of May of 2017 and just to reiterate this is uh, an interview that we are uh, doing as part of a uh, group of interviews um, African Americans in transportation and we are looking to get personal stories of people in the field um, and we will be making this content available to researchers who are working on uh, papers, uh, projects, sometimes documentaries, lots of different ways that, that information and oral history interviews can, can be used. So uh, I want to thank you for agreeing to do the interview and welcoming me into your lovely home. And um, how, are how are you today? I'm fine. Good. I'm fine. How Good. about you? I'm doing well. Good. Doing well. Um, so I want to ask... And this is the question we ask everybody from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Where and when were you born? I was born in Washington, D.C. in September 1949. Okay. And you, was your family from here originally? Actually, uh, on my father's side, my family is from a town called Whitfield, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And on my mother's side, uh, my family is from uh, the... Baltimore, Laurel, Maryland area. Did they come to D.C. for work? You know, I really don't know. Okay. That's a good question. I, I, I don't, I really don't know. Um, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if that wasn't at least one of the motivations. It wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Did they come together, or did they meet once they got here? Uh, I think they met. They met in this area, mm -hmm. would be my guess. Okay. Uh, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. Uh, hmm. And I won't have a chance to ask them either. Do you know what they did for a living? Do you remember? Well, uh... Not specifically. Well, I know my father joined the military at a very young age, and my mother, um, I don't know for certain, but given the time, okay, uh, I would presume that they were in menial service kinds of jobs. Uh, uh, they were both high school educated, but they weren't any professional fields. Okay. okay. So they uh, worked with opportunities were uh, available, would be my guess. So you said your father was in the military? Yeah. What branch? Air Force. Air Force? Mm -hmm. And did he, was he, did he have any kind of military career or did he just go in for the four years and? Short time. And if, Short time. did he serve during World War II? Um, I think he was probably on the edge of it and after. Okay. I don't think he was actually, well, let me see, when did he go in? He went in, he probably went in in 45 or 46, okay. somewhere there. Yeah, I don't, I don't think, uh, no, he wasn't back then, I don't think. Okay. What was it like growing up in D.C. in the 50s? Um, I guess really 50s and 60s. Yeah. Um, I, I can't, looking back, uh, there were, there were boundaries. Um, uh, I know from just, uh, uh, what little I can remember, um, uh, we would, I don't remember going downtown and shopping that much. I remember that when it came for school, time for school clothes or uh, Easter, uh, it was a store just on the other side of what's now the 
uh, Whitney Young Bridge. It was the Sousa Bridge, Morton's. And that was basically the store where we shop, black family shop. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in fact, Morton's has been closed or out of business now probably 30, 40 years. But the Morton's awning still sits on top of that building. Really? And it's a different business now. But that Morton's awning sits on top of that building. I do remember that. And I also uh, know very well that I was in the first group in 1960 to integrate the boys club that sat in our community that we couldn't go to. So was your neighborhood mixed race, but there were still things within the neighborhood that were off limit to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. That's exactly, that's a good way of describing it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what was that like? What was that experience like? Did your parents prepare you for that? Um, um, specific conversation you just kind of learn from behavior mm -hmm. observation you know um, yeah it wasn't about conversation around that and again you're talking you know I mean I'm 9, 10, 11 you know 12 years old um, so uh, yeah it wasn't until mid 60s uh, uh, when the civil rights movement was really becoming uh, more and more uh, news uh, focused that you started to uh, get a sense of you know what the realities were uh, so yeah that's how I remember that did your family participate in any of the marches or any of the activities related? Not to my knowledge, no. Very okay. average, ordinary people. Mm -hmm. And tell me about school. What did you... How did you feel about school when you were a kid? Well, um, we were, looking back on we were mostly segregated. Uh, there were... Uh, in each grade, from like maybe the fifth grade on, I can remember there being one or two Asians in the class. They were always very smart. Um, there was a white family that lived on the block. in school, you now we were mostly segregated. Mm -hmm. This was late 50s, early 60s. Mm -hmm. segregated. But just in general, did, what, did you like sports? Did you like math? Did you... I like sports. I like math. I like music, too. Yeah? Did you play any instruments? Yeah, saxophone. Was it important for your parents that you get a good education and stay in school? Yeah. 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 Now... And were, I'm sorry, and were you an only child, or did you have... Yeah, okay. only child. Now, a good education, from the standpoint of my family, was high school. There wasn't any talk around the dinner table, college, that wasn't even on their radar. So, that, that looking back, in retrospect, that suggested that, that they had limited... Um, as I've come to learn more about my past, my, my, my relatives in the past, they had... Limited uh, opportunities, limited aspirations. Um, uh, the military for the men, primarily my my father and my uncle, they were the two principal men uh, that I was closest to at that time, was uh, uh, the military. That's how they got out of their little town. Uh, they didn't offer them much. And... Uh, tried to, you know, move forward. Um, so, but, but, uh, um, I had an aunt, though, their sister, who was the valedictorian of her class. 
and she um, she uh, actually worked for the uh, NSA in the late fifties. Oh, really? Yeah. What was her position there? I don't know. Well, I guess so, because it's the NSA. I don't know. <laughs> Which was when I, when I when I think when I look back now and can understand better, mm -hmm. I mean, that was huge. That was huge. Um, I don't know exactly what she did. Uh, and she died young, so mm -hmm. um, she never saw the full fruition of that. Um, but uh, for for me personally. Again, high school was the was the, the goal. Yeah, I primarily was raised by my grandparents. Really? Yeah, I was raised by my grandparents. And they moved here when your were they your mother's grandparents or your fathers? Fathers. So fathers so they came when he came to DC. They came somewhere. Along somewhere along somewhere. the way. Yeah. Um. So what was expected of you? If your if your parents had gone to high school, it, was it expected that you would graduate high school and then what? What was it? There was no get a good job. Get a good job. Get a good job. That's it. That's that's the extent of the discussion. Okay. What actually happened? Well, um, I did pretty good in school. Uh, uh, until I got to high school, and then, you know, you start getting other interests, and so. Girls? Yeah. Uh, but I, I was always on the honor roll. I was, actually, I was in honors class. Uh, and uh, so I managed to uh, uh, do enough to get to graduate. And a life changing event occurred between my junior my senior year um, when when I guess 10th grade when one of the assignments was to um, write a letter to the college that you wanted to attend so my letter was to uh, armed forces to which the armed forces okay you know because that's all I knew yeah, there was no, again, there was no talk about college. They didn't have the means to um, uh, establish a college fund. Things a lot of folks take, take for granted now. A lot of us didn't have any of that coming up, you know. Um, and that was it, you know. Well, uh, the the... the the one, the one huge plus for those of us growing up in the city and in school was the um, summer school work program. Okay. What was that? That was a program funded by the D.C. government that um, they had a block of jobs that 16 year olds and up could apply for and um, work this summer. Okay. So the first time I was eligible was after the 11th grade and that thrust me into the real world and around adults and the particular job I had was working for the General Services Administration as a custodian. So I worked with folk who were considered on the lower end of the job um, hierarchy, income hierarchy. And notwithstanding their, their issues or problems or whatever, almost to a person, they were encouraging, because I wasn't the only one, to us young people uh, to stay in school. Mm -hmm. Get as much education as you can get. I mean, I had one guy tell me flat out and said, <clears throat> you don't want to spend your life doing what I'm doing. So, if you can go to school, 
trying to go to school. So I came back in the fall with a whole renewed attitude on what I wanted to do. And uh, um, um, that's when Cal College first got on my radar. And when I started talking about going to college, uh, you know, my family didn't understand what that was about. You know, uh, but bless their hearts, though, they were supportive. And um, make a long story short, um, I applied to Howard University, which was, here, here again, was another uh, rude awakening. Um, you can't just apply as you know, you can't just apply to school. You have to apply and pay a fee. I'm going to come up with $50, $60 for a lot of school. So I came up with $160, and that was at Howard University. So if I didn't get to at Howard University, I don't even know what Plan B was going to be. But I got accepted. Okay. And then, now it's, now it's uh, uh, once I got accepted, now it's the next step on how am I going to go? How am I going to pay for it? Okay. Well, at that time, and this is what really irks me about what kids face nowadays trying to go to college. You could get a job and pay your way through and not be faced with a lifetime of, of debt. Now, there were folks who didn't work and got loans, but I didn't get any loans. Mm -hmm. I was able to work a job at minimum wage, save up the money because the school, the school, the way they did it was, okay, you pay, I think you pay a third or a half at the beginning, or, and then you pay another third or another piece, a fourth or what. And I was able to save up enough from the summer job to get that first big payment to start, and then I kept a job and pay and saved up money to pay for each installment that I needed to and did that all the way through. Now, after I got past freshman year, sophomore year, I mean, I'm getting better jobs because I got two years of college education now. Now, I'm staying at home with grandma and granddad, but I'm taking care of everything else about myself. I'm just staying under the roof. I'm feeding myself. I'm doing everything else. And I did that. Um, all the way through. And in the meantime, while I'm in college, I'm also in the ROTC program for the Air Force. So I'm getting an Air Force commission. And so when I graduated, I graduated with a degree and with an Air Force commission. And I immediately, immediately, coming out with college education, Air Force salary, I'm not a head of household. I'm making more doing what I'm doing than my grandparents ever saw. Mm -hmm. And when you were 22? Yeah, 22. 22. How did that feel? Gratifying. Very gratifying. Very gratifying. And I took care of each one of them to the end of their lives, uh, which is also gratifying. And Grandma lived to be 92. Oh, nice. 92. So she was part of our family. She, she actually lived here. Really? Yeah, she actually got to live here for about. 10 years, 10, 12 years. She got to live here for 12 years. So that's all good. Yeah. That's all good. Yeah. So what came after college? You graduated from Howard? Well, I had to do... Um, um, and and your degree was in economics. Mm -hmm. Actually, so let me back up a little. What led you down that path? Like, what was appealing to you about getting an economics degree? Well, I kind of backed into that because I started out, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I like math. Mm -hmm. Started out as a math major. That was rough. That was rough. And I struggled through and got through, oh, well, I think I failed one of those calculus courses and I repeated it. Uh, but one of the... Um, one of the uh, uh, electives that we were granted was a, no, it was a, I think it was a social science requirement because it was a liberal arts education, so you know they try to give you a broad exposure to a lot of different things. So I, I chose 
a survey of economics as my social science uh, elective. Okay. And I liked it. I liked it. So that was the impetus for... What was it that you liked about it? Uh, I guess it, it, it really, it was more, it had more personal application than uh, the esoteric nature of numbers. You know, I like numbers and economics has a lot of computation, but it's in a context of, of predicting behavior and, and measuring uh, um, uh, productivity and that, those kinds of things. So that was, that was basically it because further down the line, I mean, an economics major is not a cakewalk. There's art in it. Okay, if you get my drift. Mm -hmm. There's art in it. Um, and so so I switched my major to, to an economics major and a math minor. So I was almost halfway there with the math minor, or even though completing the minor wasn't a cakewalk either. But uh, uh, that's how that happened. And you have your degree, and you have your commission. I got to serve. And now you got to serve. Got to serve. So, tell me about that. Well, that's another story. Um, and uh, uh, I, I'll say this, and I'll say this for a camera. Um, uh, I firmly believe in my heart that the Lord guided my path and had me walk in a certain way and put certain things on me and in my spirit that that ended up uh, having such a uh, tremendous benefit, not just for myself, but for those, my loved ones, and those, my, my, my old loved ones and then the ones after me. Um, The obligation to serve, okay, um, you could postpone that. They allowed you 12 months before you had to start the service. So I said, well, I'm going to stick around as long as I can because my grandparents are getting older, or they are older, and I want to be available to help them as much as I could for as long as I could quite go away. And I was talking to uh, my professor of air science. That's, um, active duty officer who's assignment is in RTC. Um, and air science was one of the courses you took in mm -hmm. for undergrad? Mm -hmm. And what is air science? Air, Air Force. Aviation. Air Force. Air Force. Air Force. Air Force. Okay, Air Force. okay, Air Science. Okay. Um, so this is a captain. Okay. And he was just, you know, talking, like, they, 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 they get to know us and find out what we're going to do. And so he, he learned that I was, he asked me where I was, when was I come, going in, and I told him it was a year out. He asked me why. And I explained to him, I just explained about wanting to be around. So he said, well, you know, the Air Force is very um, uh, sensitive and accommodating where it can be to personal needs these days. You might want to consider applying for a hardship assignment. Can't hurt. I did. But this is right in the middle of Vietnam, right? 72. Well, it wasn't the middle. It wasn't the middle. It was toward the end. It was toward the end. Uh, toward the end. Okay. Yeah, it was toward the end. Okay. And that's another story. No. Okay. And, and he said, uh, I said, okay. And I did. And that was like September. I graduated in the middle of the year, so it's like September of my last semester. Uh, by November, I got a call early one morning from this captain, uh, I forget what base, I think it was in Texas. And, and he told me that I had been granted an assignment. And my assignment would be uh, at Andrews Air Force Base. And I start. February. So here it is now. I'm coming out 
of school in January and a couple of weeks. And then in February, I'm in the Air Force, but I'm going to leave home. And then, okay, so, so, so that pushes off, uh, at least in my mind, uh, when I have to face what I'm going to do again. Or I, you know. Well, I go in in February of 70, 72, okay. In November of 72, they come out with this um, uh, notification that that the war is nearing an end, nearing an agreement, and that the pipeline of Air Force officers that have been been trained and slated to uh, complete their training and, and join service. Unless you were what they call rated, which means a pilot, okay. Uh, those coming behind me, they had the option of either cross training into an aviation field, or in 90 days ending the active duty service and assume reserve status for the duration of their requirement. And those of us who were in. We had the option on our first anniversary of doing the same thing. And what I was faced with was probably an assignment to South Dakota to train in the missile area where I could get out. And guess what I did? I got out. On my anniversary was February 1973. Okay. So now I'm no longer active duty. And the rest of my term was inactive reserves. That's how I served. Okay. So then it was a matter of then getting a job and going from there. Okay. And, and but you said Vietnam was another story? Well, Vietnam ended. And right yeah. At that time. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. I didn't know if you meant that. Because were you worried at any point about being drafted? That would have been back. Earlier? When I first started college. Okay. okay. Yeah. That, that, and I was like kind of in the middle. I hadn't gone to college. I might have been drafted, but my number was high enough. That I might not have been. Okay. Yeah. So what did you do after you um, left the Air well, Force? When I, when I worked, um, I had worked mostly in retailing. Actually, they had a lot of opportunities in retailing. Uh, Part-time, young people. Um, and I had uh, uh, worked quite a bit for what was then the Woodwood and Lothwood um, the pop store chain in DC and had a pretty decent track record with them and so uh, I didn't go to them right away I went to one of their competitors who then went out of business then I went to them and they gave me a junior executive job uh, and in the meantime though I wanted to get into the federal service mm -hmm. okay uh, which was a, a process where at that time you took an exam um, so I had to I worked maybe eight or nine months uh, in retail while I was sorting, sorting through that uh, uh, so I still had a contact with one of my professors um, who taught me statistics and he had contact with um, at least one contact for sure with the Bureau of Labor Statistics who at that time were under the gun because they uh, had had been closed door to uh, minority professionals. They had. So he wrote a profile for me to his contact in HR and uh, they were prepared to bring me on as an economist, an economist, provided I got to a certain level on the exam. Uh, well, the exam was such that with you had um, military folk who got ten extra points, mm -hmm. so you had to get a certain, you had to get close to a hundred in order to even make the cut. 
So first time, I think I got 90-something, and then I got five points for, for my time, and that still didn't put me over, huh? And they say you can't really study for those kinds of uh, uh, tests, but I did. Because I knew that the one area that, that um, I probably could, could in, increase my, uh, 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 my scoring was the vocabulary. So I, I started just learning a lot of words. Didn't need to get a few more, a couple more, you know. And I did, and, and, and got over the hump, and got selected for a junior commerce position at Bill of Rape Statistics. And that started my government professional career. A junior what? Economist. A junior economist? Mm -hmm. And so what were you responsible for in that job? Um, and let me, let me, I want to make sure I give a shout out to that professor. His name was Leon Hunter. Leon Hunter. Uh, I always forget how critical that was. That was the beginning. That was the actual beginning of my being able to get it started. Government career with, with him writing that that profile, getting it to the right people, getting it to their hands, and then putting putting me in a position to get selected. Then everything else followed from that. But that was the beginning. Leon Hunter. Um, uh, I worked in the um, Wholesale Price Index Office. Are you familiar with Wholesale uh, Consumer Price Indexes and stuff like that? A little. Okay, that's how they set, um, that's how they measure inflation. Okay, so in order to, and, and they're made up of, indexes are made up of uh, indices for all of the primary industries in the country. So I was assigned to get consumer prices and get wholesale prices. So I was in the wholesale price and working on um, petroleum products, which was huge at the time because of gas prices and all that stuff. So everybody watched that gasoline index all the time. Okay. So I did that, and then a couple years later they added uh, leather products. Also, I ended up doing leather, which was an interesting interesting uh, topic as well. I learned that uh, I mean leather, leather is a derived industry. You know, derived? It, yes, derived it derives from uh, the meat industry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. um, you don't kill a cow for the leather, you kill a cow for food. Mm -hmm. You rather than throw it out of the way, you use it, you got industry, shoes and clothes and everything else. So um, that was interesting. And I did that for three, that was 74 to 78. And uh, um, and I went from a GS7 to a GS12. In that period, and and then um, I applied and got a position at the Coast Guard. They needed an economist, uh, and it was a, it was a promotion to thirteen. They offered me a thirteen where I was, but I was able to do something. I, in in index index uh, work wasn't I, what I consider. Um, one of a better description, in-depth economic analysis. You're okay. using numbers more than your brain. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I shouldn't be putting you're crunching, that in. You're crunching, crunching numbers, numbers more than, um, and you crunch, I can crunch more numbers in this other job, but you're crunching numbers more than, than you're, you're, you're very narrow. Mm -hmm. You know, you're very narrow. Um, uh, and I want an opportunity to kind of expand my economic um, economic uh, perspective, an analytical perspective. So I'm to the Coast Guard job. Mm -hmm. And what they hired me for, um, again, all this, this is uh, connected to the whole petroleum industry. Right? We have so much trouble back then, if you recall. Uh, with, um, I've heard about it. I was very young at the time. Very young at the time. Yeah. 
Uh, it was a big, big deal. I mean, so much so, um, they had, they had a, uh, well, the, we, we, we imported oil to this country in, in big tankers. Okay. Well, there, there are only certain places where those big tankers can come in. And so you need what's called a deep water port. There were only a couple of those in there around the Gulf. Okay. So they needed another one, and, and, and there were companies vying for that because it's big money. And there, there, there were a number of analyses that need to be done to, to uh, make a decision on who gets the deep water port, who gets to do that. And uh, I was hired by the Coast Guard to do the deep water ports economic study. That was in 1978. Did you have to go to Galveston? No. No? Well, actually, I went to, I went to Austin, though. The state capital? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did go to Austin. Yeah, we had, we had to meet with some people. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't go to Galveston. I didn't go to Galveston. Galveston was one. Corpus Christi was another one. Um, and did you make it to any of the coastal cities, or did you only go to Austin? I only went to Austin. Okay. Doing for that, I only went to Austin. Although, now that you ask, I had to go to Boston for something. I don't remember what that connection was. Yeah, I had to go to Boston for something. But that was that 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 study was what, what would fall under the um, description of cost. Benefit analysis. Okay. And did you write the entire thing, mm -hmm. or you wrote the entire? And you did all the. Mm -hmm. And is this the first big project you had once you went over to work with the Coast Guard? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the only one I ended up doing because I wasn't there long. Okay. I went over there in nineteen seventy eight. Mm hmm. Um, and uh, the experience, that was a good experience. I, the, the people there, and I like to give some shout out to some of these folk. Um, of course. I worked, my boss's name was, uh, he was Commander uh, Parkton. I don't remember his first name. P-A-R-T-I-N. And then his boss was a Captain Gilbert Sherborne. And they kind of gave me a free reign. Gave me a free reign uh, to, um, I think I'll do it. Free reign. Uh, I mean, they, uh, they 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 fully confident in my work, and we had to defend this. Uh, to Are you saying that because they were white? That they were fully confident in your work? Not necessarily. Okay. Just because they were professional seniors. Okay. Yeah, and 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 um, uh, it tend it tends to be I was the expert, so okay. They treated me like I was the expert. Good. Okay. And they defended me um, in meetings with the Department of Transportation Management. Uh, I remember this one particular meeting with a lawyer uh, who thought he he had I don't know some sort of he felt good about himself. Let me put it that way. And uh, we left him feeling very confident in what we were doing. And the captain was right there with me. Uh, I mean, I, I, I was able to be very direct, uh, correct him when he was going, correct the lawyer when he was going off on, on a, a tangent. And uh, this was just good, very good. It seems like you were really, like you were finally with that report able to do something that fulfilled you more than just crunching the numbers. Yeah, that yeah, that was that was a takeaway. That was a takeaway. But now let me the backtrack at the the BLS, um uh I guess uh the one thing that is lasting that I that I did was they 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 put by then I guess I was Journeyman, 11, maybe 11, Jesse 11. They brought in another 
junior economist to work this area, DS7, and gave him the task of developing an index for unleaded gasoline because unleaded wasn't the thing yet. Unleaded was just coming in. So all the indices were on for leaded gasoline. And so I mentored him and guided him in, in, in doing that. And that was a huge addition or product for that organization, accomplishment for that organization. And I saw myself as being a point person in terms of developing the young man and as well as getting that product out. Um, but we did, we did each, each month you did a, uh, an industry analysis that, that informed the powers that be uh, on how to speak to what's going on in the economy with respect to various industries. So that was a good responsibility that we had. Um, but this is senior. The senior work here, senior work, and uh, um, that was that was just the beginning too. Just the beginning. Another person out of the Coast Guard that um, um, was uh, have a lot of respect for and a lot of appreciation to was Captain Rydell. When I did the study, then I was shifted over to another part of the organization. And he was very supportive. Uh, uh, and he had a secretary who was uh, uh, more uh, uh, attentive and supportive than I really realized. She came, I came into my office one day and I saw an announcement for a position for GS-14 at the FAA. Not only been at the Coast Guard, just a little over years. So I wasn't looking for a job, I, you know. But I applied for that because she just gave me the, the announcement. Why do you think she did that? Um, being nice. Being nice. I don't know. I never asked her why. I don't know. Uh, she's a nice person. I guess. I don't know. Uh, but I, I applied just primarily only because she she did it. Mm -hmm. I did, you know, didn't want to just lay it aside. Someone do, does something for you. you know. mm -hmm. Okay. And what was the position? Economist at the FAA and policy for the entire department for or the for policy. the entire administration for the Federal Aviation Administration. Yeah. One of the economists. Okay. Just I was just another staff economist. Okay. But I was a senior staff. I, that was a senior staff economist. Okay. Uh, the FAA, the Coast Guard only had two economists in the whole organization. The FAA had an office, you know, okay. and um, I applied and got that job. That was in February of 1980. February 1980. And the FAA is where I spent most of my career. Mm -hmm. That was really... That was, that was, that, that was, I mean, that was a huge step to go from Coast Guard to the FAA like that mm -hmm. um, in such a short period of time. What was your first job? At the uh, FAA? Yeah. What were you working on? Like, I know you were an economist, but what were yeah. you? Yeah. Um, actually, I was, uh, I was back up to another economist, and they were working on, um, at that time, they were working on, uh, Advancements to the national aviation system, you know, the equipment and all of that. Okay, so I was kind of floating around, and I finally got those uh, an assignment that the or two organizations end up aviation. You had aviation plans and had aviation policy, and they decided that you really need to put plans and policy together in one office. So the director of policy became the director of aviation policy and plans, and the director of plans was his deputy. Okay. And so I got into that office, and they had uh, pretty broad, they combined the, the two offices and the, the responsibilities. And my first assignment was to, to 
prepare to do the develop the um, what they call the establishment and discontinuance criteria for precision landing system. That is, those systems that enable an aircraft to guide its way into a landing on that, on, okay, electronically. Okay. And every airport wants one, but every airport doesn't need one. They don't get enough, they don't get enough traffic or uses that. They don't get enough traffic to justify that investment. Mm -hmm. Those are huge investments. But once an airport gets one, um, uh, the, 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 the local community sees that as an opportunity for them to generate economic, have economic stimulus. Okay. And that was Eight or nine, maybe six, eight months. That ended up being that. What were your find? Can you summarize your findings? Um. They're not really findings. They are they are criteria. Okay. Criteria. Okay. And so, whenever the decision comes up, they'll apply these criteria. Those numbers were incorporated into a uh, an algorithm. We then plug in population, traffic, and that kind of thing, and come up with a decision based on costs and benefits of whether or not a particular location warrants this type of type of system. And that's the one that put me on the map. Yeah. It was a very it was an important document for the industry, for the profession. And you see on the front. Your name is on it. That's right. I saw that uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's right now that is in I found back in back in two thousand nine I went and did some consulting work back at the FAA. And that old office that I was in, they still have all those from all, from all the different systems. And mine is in there. And they approached me about possibly helping them update that because they still use that as it is. Really? Is so in layman's way. terms, what did this do for aviation? It, um, it... It enabled the agency to make more informed decisions about where it put its resources for that equipment. Do more um, airports have this equipment today than they would have had in the beginning? Actually, actually. Even if it's like a more modern, newer version of yeah, the equipment? I don't know. I can't answer that. Okay. To be honest. I guess, I guess what you would hope is that, what one would hope is that, they, they, it helped them to be able to put the equipment, to make the decisions to put the equipment where it was needed the most, given limited resources. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we have some scientific, quasi-scientific method, quantitative method mm -hmm. of making those decisions. So yeah, that was, that was the... Uh, the one the you're one. still very proud of this today. I can yeah. see it yeah. as as you should be as yeah. you should be. You know, my first library job was in a government documents department. Okay. So I'm feeling a little nostalgic just looking at because they would come in and you know they have their own number system, the SUDOC system. Mm -hmm. I have toured the government printing office as mm -hmm. a, as mm -hmm. a print, um, before. You know, they had the lighted bin system where they mm -hmm. would put it, put everything mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. So um, this is. In my own way, this has taken me back to my early library career. Okay. So, yeah. I actually worked for the government printing office, one of my part-time jobs when I was in college. Really? Mm -hmm. 
Yep. Yep, that was one. Um, and the office at the time, I mentioned the manager or the director. Uh, it was Harvey Sophia. S A F I R? S A F E E R. He was the director. Um, Norm Wow hired me. Um, real, real low key, smooth, but effective guy. Mm -hmm. John Rogers was my division manager, supportive. And Steve Zabin was my branch manager. And um, so this was done under Steve Zabin's um, uh, supervision or office. No, I take that back. He was gone. He was gone. It was uh, Ken Byron. Anyway. And what was the last name? By? Steve Zabin. Z A M O N? Z A I D M A N. Steve Zabin. Okay. And then the other last name? Uh, Ken Byram. B Y R A M. Um, and as a result of this, this demonstrated my technical analytical competence. Okay. But I guess I demonstrated uh, some other things in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't need a lot of supervision. I didn't need a lot of supervision. Mm -hmm. And I think that Zabin was convinced of that when he was um, he was away for some period of time and he left some things he didn't specifically leave some things to be done but when he got back some things that he thought he'd have to do I'd already done okay so when he got reassigned to another organization the branch leadership, then what they usually do is they rotate the uh, acting um, responsibility among the senior analysts. So he said what he would do, so he, he said he couldn't just assign anybody, he had to rotate it, but he'd make me the first one. And in making me the first one, I never relinquished it. <laughs> I became branch manager. Really? Yeah. And, and and that was primarily, all, they all had to be in concurrence with, but Harvey Sophia was the decision maker. Mm -hmm. and, and he left, he left an impression that I'll always remember. He, he, he embodied, he embodied um, what I, what I call true, true leadership. Um, in that his his personal um, persona, maybe I'm being redundant. He he struck people as as gruff. You know, he's a big guy too, uh, overbearing, um, but what? You found out about him was that he was fair, he only, he, he expected, he held you accountable, but he also took care of you. And he was one of those people, I know a couple of people in my, in my group of, of mentors, I call them, who were either you liked them or you didn't. And I can deal with that. You never, there was never anything wishy-washy about them. And, 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 and it was because they were straight shooters. And when he, when he made me permanent, it was him, made me permanent. Um, later on, he, he commented. And again, this was a period, this was like 83, 84. Diversity wasn't in the lexicon. Mm -hmm. That wasn't even out there as like it is now. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, um, uh, and fairness was a little bit more elusive. Right? And in all 
these people I'm telling, they white people. All these folks are white people. Um, he said to me, he said, how could I not make you a manager? He said, you're natural. You know, he said, what are they going to do to me? Bust me back to the 15? Because he was, he was a senior executive. You know, <laughs> what, what are they going to do? That's how, that's how he put it. Uh, you, sometimes you had to really listen to him. You didn't know if he was really, when he was complimenting you, sometimes it was backhanded. Mm -hmm. But you knew, but you, could, you, you picked up on it. Right? Um, and another impression, and he really, when I, the point I made about him embodying true leadership, uh, he was concerned that he, he had gotten feedback. He did, he had done, he, he, he had done, he was doing, he was doing, he was doing um, uh, employee attitude surveys before they were, you know, mm -hmm. common. Mm -hmm. he, he, he initiated one. And the feedback that he got on, when people could be anonymous was some unhappiness. And and he had it in his own mind who the problem might be. He thought it might, I might be because I was new so forth. He found out that that wasn't the case. But what he also, though, found out or acknowledged was that he was part of the problem. Really? Yeah. And so he had this thing. I mean, it wasn't anything. It wasn't uncommon for Harvey to see somebody over halfway across the room that did something or done something that's tasteful for him, and he's yelling out at him, mm -hmm. blasting him across the room. And he just said to me in the conversation, he said, um, I had to realize that I was part of the problem. He said, these little ladies don't like hearing me blasting people all across the room. And I got to be different. I got to be better. And that stuck with me from that point on, from that point on. That that's what it takes. You know, you have to really be willing to look in the mirror and and acknowledge something that doesn't look right and try to fix it. And he did. And from that point on he started getting all these human relation awards and he was all you know, he was getting them because he was doing things. He got his technology, uh, you know, he was he had us doing using a computer before again, that was demanded of everybody, you know. Uh, so I'm going on about him, but that, that's a, that was an impression. Mm -hmm. Um uh, and those other guys um, I mentioned, like, like John Rogers and Harvey, when I was working on finishing that master's in economics, they allowed me to use my discretion, not to study at work if I wanted to, whenever I felt like I needed to you know, do that and get my job done, mm -hmm. didn't have a problem with it. And they gave me time to go up to the school during the school during the work day for an hour or two if I had to take care of some business and come back. No issues. No issues. Really? Really. Do you think it's because they saw ultimately that that would benefit them? Well. Or is that? That, that always plays in it. Right. But A it, demonstration of your value to them? I think it, it's all of the above and their commitment to taking care of the people. Mm -hmm. It's worthwhile, they mm -hmm. want to support it. You were at the FAA a long time. 22 years. Did that change over time? What do you mean? In terms of how they treated their employees and... Uh, yeah. I it mean, did. not for you yeah, specifically, it did. It did. but maybe the culture. Yeah, it did. It did. They, 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 uh, they, they, uh, they did quite a bit to, um, make the workplace as best as it could be, to provide opportunities for personal development, uh, uh, assignments, uh, yeah, they did a lot, they did a lot. Um, now, I've been there, but I've heard people in the last 15 years, 10, 15 years, Talk about how someone has eroded, gone back the other way. 
Uh, but back to my tenure, I, I enjoyed that time. Okay. For the most part, I enjoyed that time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I enjoyed that time. So, um, you were the manager of the regulatory analysis branch mm -hmm. from 83 to 87, and in that time you managed to earn a Master of Arts in Economics from Georgetown. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, that, that, um, that's another long story. I would love to hear it. Uh, I actually started that program when I was in the Air Force. Okay. In 72. And the funny thing about it, I was, I was so hot to try and anxious to get out of, out of college. I was fed up. You know, I was so glad to graduate. And so I started, at, started the service. And, well, I had been used to, for all of the, those years, of working and going to school. Managing my time. Constantly managing my time. Now, I'm in the service. The job is not that demanding. You know, I got all this time. You know, it didn't feel right. I have to do something productive to fill up this time. It, ne it never was in my mind, nowhere in my mind when I first graduated that I was going to go to graduate school. Now here I am, three months into my military life, and I'm deciding, I might as well go to grad school. <laughs> That's how that happened. And I, I, I went in the Air Force in February of 72 and started the graduate program in economics at Georgetown in September of 72. Okay. And you see, I didn't get that last one until 85. Yeah. Did, did you just sort of leave it behind for a while then pick it back up when you got to the FAA? Or did you take it little by little over? Well, the intent was to go straight through. Mm -hmm. And I did up until 74 and I got burned out. Mm. And it, it, it was a combination of actually the professor that I got, he just was ridiculous in the demands. And he just burned me out. Mm -hmm. I mean, he just burned me out. And so I dropped out in 74. I had 21 hours and I only needed 30 for the coursework. And I dropped out at 21. I would have had 24, but that 22nd, 23rd, 24, that was incomplete. That was his class. So I just fell up. And it took me until that was toward the end of 74. It took me to until early 76. So I was finally able, felt like I could go back and try to finish this thing. So early 76, I went back and finished up the coursework. So then it was a matter of taking a comprehensive exam, which I did, and failed. So to give you two chances, and that was in 77, to give you two chances, and I kept trying to study to get ready for it. Just couldn't do it. Just couldn't do it. So, so for the period of 77, to 84, nothing, nothing. But then as I'm, I'm working now, I'm a manager, and I feel like I need to finish this thing. Plus I got PhDs working for me now. Mm -hmm. You know, even though I've got the coursework for masters, you really need to get validated. You know? And that's another story. I don't know if you want to hear that one. Well, um, so I'm in my office one day. This is in the, like maybe November or 7th of 84. I called the school, called the economics department. And the interesting thing about it, Georgetown is that they, they rotate the chairmanship of the departments. Most schools, Guy getting whoever gets in the department chair of a chair of a department it stays there as long as they want to or whatever. They rotate it. You have, you have a finite amount of time, and somebody else is coming in. Okay. So when I called, the department chair was a professor named Douglas Brown, who I remember from 72, when I first started, he was a young 
professor teaching microeconomics, and other, among other things. So I started talking to him, introduced myself, told him my situation, and he asked me a couple of things, one of which was, well, uh, what, did I, what I've been doing. I told him I've been working in the field, you know, so I hadn't been away from the field doing things. And what I was anticipating to hear was, you've been out of school all these years, your, your coursework is stale, you got to take this course and that course and that course, and then we'll go from there. But what he said to me instead was, okay, if you can come in here and pass a comprehensive exam, I'll recommend to the school that they give you a degree. No, That's unheard of. Unheard of. Unheard of. Unheard of. No cakewalk, no. but at least an opportunity. Okay? And so we embarked on it. Well, he came back a few weeks later and said, he approached the school, and he, he said, they're willing to let me do that, but because I had gotten off the roll, now, you, you probably know from experience that if you're not enrolled in class, you have to re at least be enrolled as a continuing education student. So, I had all these semesters that I hadn't enrolled, so they wanted me to pay the enrollment fee for all those semesters. That was nine hundred some dollars. What can I say? I'll pay the nine hundred dollars. Okay. And so he said the tech. The, Next test is going to be in June. Now this is December, so I've got six months or so to study. Okay, again, no cakewalk, no picnic, but you know. Um, so I start. So I study. He told me what the four the four, four areas how the test is going to be structured: microeconomic theory, macroeconomic theory, quantitative analysis, and an elective, whatever your field specialty is going to be. Well, I chose money and banking, which is a microeconomic topic. So I can kind of get a twofer a little bit with that. So I started studying these. I was out, okay, a lot of time. That was, that was, that was what I, that's what I needed to be able to study at work to help me get the time in. Right? After I think a month, two months, he told me, he said, you haven't been in classroom, so you have, you've been out of the habit of taking tests and that sort of thing, so we need to really give you a Bach exam. A practice test? Yeah. Okay. Okay. He said, now, and this is what he said, he said, now, I don't know what's going to be on the exam, but I know that kind of, they tend to, these subjects, they tend to cover, so this is what you, know, what you need to do. And so he set, set up an exam. Now, no, the normal exam would be one hour per topic. So that's four straight hours. Okay. Okay. Well, he's going to give me a, 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 a question in each one. And I'll take, I'm to take 30 minutes. That's all I have to work on, on, on each one. And of course, I'm going to do that. I'm not going to cheat. You know, I can't refer to any text. I can't do anything. And I took the test home and set aside some time, started working on it. And I did as I was supposed to do. Took it back to him. In a few days, he called me up and he said, "You passed two of the questions." In half of a third. Now the other one, the quantitative, you need some work on. And then he said, "You just might pull this off." And that's when I knew he became my advocate. Then. Yeah. He became my advocate. And uh, because I, I, up to that point, my sense was that he was. He was being being dutiful, you know. Mm -hmm. um, in his position, he's he, he, that's what he needs to be doing, you know. Um, 
He told me later, he said, most people don't get through it, you know. Um, and sure enough, as the test got closer, and I'm studying, like, I'd say two weeks before the test, and even up to three or four days before the test, he'll call me now, and he'll say, you probably need to, we haven't covered since, you probably need to study since. Oh. Uh, you haven't, we haven't talked about it. You probably need to study second sentence. He knew what I was going to be faced with. Mm -hmm. And he was getting me ready. Well, the time came when I took the test. That was in June of 85. And then it's the waiting process. And guys at work were very encouraging. One PhD on the job, you know, after a week or so went by, he said, well, no news really is good news. Okay, you hear that. You know, you know. So then I had to go and travel for for uh, some training. And I just couldn't take it anymore. So I called him. Because yeah, he, he said, take a while, so I'll, you know, I'll, I'll get back to you. But I hadn't heard back from him. So I called him. And he said, well, here's the deal. You passed three of the four tests, but they were so impressed with your comeback that they're going to let you take that fourth one over again. And the professor of that field, he says he will coach you to get you ready for it. Wow. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's the Lord working. That's the Lord working. Um, so that was Dan Westbrook. He was the quantitative. It was the quantitative one that I didn't pass. Uh, I worked with him for a month. And after that, I took it and got my degree. But now, get back to Doug Brown again. Okay. You want to hold on? No. Uh, you put your finger up and I did too. I think, I think it's. Okay. Yeah, it's not okay. <laughs> no, go on. Okay, that was Professor Doug Brown. That, that he's the one who helped me through it. And then Dan Westbrook was a professor who helped me get over the hump with the, with the fourth one. So after it was done, uh, some, somewhere along the way, I, I'd go back and see these guys, of course. Mm -hmm. you know, just drop in and you know, say hi and, and, and so forth. He told me that when he first went to what it to the department now we're, we're down the road now you know mm -hmm. this is late 85 well late 84 when he went to the department he said the the professors they didn't want to let me do it and he said i need to do this and he, like we were saying take all these courses need to do that. he had nothing he had nothing and he said his response was this is a no-cost proposition to the school Either he passed the test, or well, he does it. What what do we have to lose by letting them take the test? So they finally relented. I didn't know any of that was going on, mm -hmm. but I had an advocate. I had an advocate, and that that that's the taking getting that degree that way is a high point for me, and having that kind of support like that is even a higher, higher point for me. And when I go in from time to time over the years, I know up to about, for about four or five years, I think I went in there maybe five years after this and speak to him. And he mentioned to me, he said, Dan Westbrook still brings your name up from time to time. So he still brings your name up from time to time. I, mean, I don't see these guys anymore. I don't know where they are. They're all retired. They're older than I am. Mm. You know, <laughs> they're older than I am if they're still alive. Mm. I keep saying I'm gonna go up to the school and try to try to find them. I don't know. But that 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 was another part of my FAA, uh, my experience doing my FAA tenure. Um, then there's another mentor I haven't even mentioned. I got after two in. This gentleman named Dale McDaniel. Dale McDaniel. Dale McDaniel. 
and he was in my chain of command when I was in that policy office as an economist. I met him. I met him when I was still on the staff working the analysis. Right? Real nice guy. But he he was on he he was upstairs in the on the staff side. We on the line side. And um, um, I mentioned I had gotten the assignment uh, appointment to the ICAF. ICAF. Industrial College of the Armed Forces. Yeah. That came in '87. Okay. Uh, and, and it was during that period also I was able to earn that Masters of Public Administration because they all, they had a co-op with George Washington University. And I said, I'm here. I got to do this. Mm -hmm. You know? Now, one of the um, ICAF uh, instructors were trying to kind of poo-poo that, you know, you, you know you're away, this is a chance, you can wind down and this, that, and the other. And take it easy, you have to work so hard. The reality is that working is a lot harder than going to school. A lot harder than going to school. And it wasn't any problem in my doing that ICAF curriculum and doing that master's program administration at the same time. No problem at all. And it really drove home how true that was. Was when I was done with ICAF and went back to work. When I was done with the ICAF, all of that, went back to work. Mm -hmm. That first week, it was a killer. The first day I was back on the job, it took all the energy I had to get through that day to get home and to get in the bed and rest up so I can start the next day. That's how, it, how much energy working requires mm -hmm. as opposed to going to school. Mm -hmm. You know. So, I, I know that for a fact. <laughs> I know that, that drove that home. Um, but uh, Dale McDaniel was responsible for my getting appointed to the ICAF. I know he was. He never said it. Nobody else ever said it. But I know he was. And, and what is the ICAF? What, is it, what kind of program is it? It is a program that's part of the National Defense University, which you probably, probably, was, was probably more familiar to you is like when you hear War College. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So the National Defense University consists of the Industrial College of the Armed Forces and the National War College. And they make the National Defense University and they're located on Fort McNair. Okay. And it basically uh, uh, ICAF has both military and civilian students. I think the War College is just military. Mm -hmm. And they are lieutenant colonels and colonels and GS 14s and 15s that that someone thinks they might have the potential to be executives. Okay. Uh, most people who go through I can't afford to go to college and they're colonels, they may end up being a general. Okay. In fact, I know a couple who came out of there generals. Uh, Senior executive in, in, in the civil sector is equivalent to a general in the military sector. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with the courtesy or the protocols, but but there is a, like if a civilian uh, officer has business on a military base and have to spend the night, they'll want to, they, there is a relationship. Let's say a GS-15 is like equivalent to a colonel. So they'll give a GS-15 colonel accommodations. GS-14, lieutenant colonel accommodations. See, exactly, general accommodations. Like that. Okay. So, but that's what GACAF is. And it, it, um, it, uh, the Industrial College of the Armed Forces, um, uh, we, we zero in on the industries that are national, considered national defense industries, and aviation is one of them. Okay, and that ha happened to be my my industry when I was in. Uh, show you this. This is the class. Okay.
How did how did it help your career to go through this program? Uh, I don't know that it did other than when I came out of uh, I had to leave the job when I was the, direct, uh, the manager of the regulatory analysis branch taking this assignment ended that job for me okay most places some places that really helped mm -hmm. and particularly in the FAA it really didn't in my opinion, didn't do anything other than personally um, having a master's degree in public administration helped me perform, mm -hmm. but that should have helped me get consideration to the next level, and it didn't. And since you bring that up, I'll mention this. I, I made GS-15 by 1983, right? But I stayed at GS-15 for 16 years. With all this background, mm -hmm. I stayed at GS-15 for 16 years. Why? Do you, why? why? Nobody saw fit to move me any further. Mm. All right. And I'm not bitter about that, but that's the reality. I had to leave my office as director of route making in order to, I had to take that job in commercial space transportation in order to get that. And I wasn't really interested in commercial space transportation. But that was the only opportunity. So you went to the ICAF, you, that, you had that appointment, and then you came back and got... When you say you left that job, did you leave the position with the idea that you, like, were they just sort of holding the place for you to come back? It, it was a complete departure from the FAA. No, it, it was a complete departure from their position. Okay. But the FAA had to take me back. Okay. So then I was in limbo until they found another position for me. Okay. And I had a couple people help me in that regard. Um, uh, uh, it was a Dave Tuttle, who actually was the um, person who was selected to go to ICAF the next year. Mm -hmm. And he uh, um, reached out to me and we became friends. And so I kind of gave him the insight on what to look for as he did that. And he used his resources to try to help me transition back into the agency. Uh, and there was also a woman named Irene Barnett, who actually was successful in getting me assigned, which I don't have written down anywhere, but I was assigned as a special assistant, a technical assistant, to um, one of the executive directors, which is what I had, the position I held before, before going to uh, the Office of Rulemaking as the deputy. Okay. Um, which was really one of my favorite jobs. APO and rulemaking were my favorite places. So what, happened, so what is rulemaking? Rulemaking is the organization that manages the regulatory process. Okay. And the staff is primarily uh, writer, editors, and um, uh, process managers in terms of facilitating uh, a regulatory project through the system. Regulations require several levels of consensus building in order to get them through, and so we own the process. Okay. Um, and is that for the Code of Federal Regulations, or is it just regulations within the... No, for the Code. For the CFR? For CFR. Okay. FAA's, uh, the, the parts of the CFR that the FAA owns. Okay. Are responsible for. Okay. So... Um, that's another whole story. I would, yes. Okay. Um, when the director of rulemaking, he, he and I... What was his name? Chris Christie. Chris Christie. Mm -hmm. What was his name? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, 
But it's not the same Chris Christie? No. Related? No. Okay. No. In fact, he's the original Chris Christie. He's an old guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, he's another. He was the, he's the second person that I would describe as either you liked him or you didn't. Okay. Straight shooter, fair, and did a lot for me. Did a lot for me. Uh, in fact, in fact, he was looking for a deputy, and I needed to get out of um, the uh, exec as a technical assistant. That was like a placeholder for me, and he was looking for a deputy. He had actually announced, had an announcement out, and when I expressed some interest in, in, in becoming his deputy, he selected me. Um, uh, we got to know each other when I was the manager of the regulatory analysis branch. Well, Chris Christie manages the process. In regulatory analysis, our product feeds into the regulation. Okay, so I had a relationship with his office because of we provided that service to them as they put the regulation together. The regulation. And he told me early on, before I had worked for him, that I was one of the few people that around who did what he said. And that's what I guess he respected. Mm -hmm. And so when I became available, well, when I showed interest, he'd be picking right on up. Okay. And that wasn't the first time, it wasn't the last time he did something like that for me, too. Um, um, while I worked for him, he, 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 he got... He, he was selected to serve on the staff of a congressman for six months. So that left me running the office. And he had laid the groundwork for us to get additional staff. I mean, we probably almost doubled. And I hired the people. So I built that staff up. And that was like 92, maybe, 91, 92. And when I went back... In 2009, I mentioned I was consulting uh, at the FAA. Mm -hmm. I was consulting in the office of rulemaking. And some of those same people that I had hired were still there. So I was like the old uncle <laughs> around the office. It was great. It was really great. Uh, and a lot of my legacy was still around. Um, while I was in rulemaking, uh, Chris allowed me to uh, participate in this program. I, I didn't get selected for it. They had, they had, they, when, they, when they put out a call for, yeah, it is thing. They put out a call for uh, SES candidate development. SCS? What does that stand for? Uh, Senior Executive Service. That's what you're executive. That's, that's the service. Jimmy Carter instituted that. Used to be GS, GS grades went up from GS1 to GS18. Well, he kept the GS to GS15, and then the executives, he created the senior executive service. Okay. So, there's, to, to qualify for the senior executive service requires, they, 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 they want to train you, develop you, to be ready for that. That's important. Okay. So I applied for that. Figure all this stuff that I have, you know, all this experience, and everything, I'd be a shoe in. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. That was in like 90, 91, 92. So the next thing came along was the mid level management development program, which was level down. So I signed up for that and got selected for that. And Chris, Chris supported that. Uh, so it was, I could do my job and do that too. Sometimes I'd be a way to go to the training class and that kind of thing. Um, but during that period, I was also selected to serve on a commission that was formed, an airline commission that was formed by, by Bill Clinton to uh, assess um, what was needed to sustain the airline industry because it was suffering at the time. In fact, there is a document that we came up with. Where was that, Roscoe? Where was that, Roscoe?
Yep. Yep. I got him to sign it for me because he was on the commission. See, I sat, got him to sign it for me when he became FA administrator. I interviewed John Peter Paul. Did you really? I did, and because I know he wrote a separate report for this commission, the Black Covered Report. Uh -huh. Yeah, and we've digitized that and put it online at the archives. No but we work closely with kidding. the Machina. So I've interviewed Bill Sherry, um, John Peter Paul, uh, a whole a whole lot of Machinas. And when he started talking about this, I was like, now it couldn't be that this is the same. But it is. It's the same. Yeah. It's the same. Yeah. Yep. And the reason, the way I got on there, I know Dale McDaniel had something to do with that. Okay. I remember, I remember, remember I mentioned he's the one who got me on the ICAF. Mm -hmm. He's also the one who got me assigned to this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I haven't seen a copy of this report. Uh -huh. um, and it was distributed was it to the president and Congress. Yeah, yeah. Here's a profile on, a, on, your, on your guy. You might be interested to watch his interview sometime. I can send you a link to it. When okay. I, when I send, okay. Uh, okay. It's all online, so. Okay. And you'll kind of get a feel for how your stuff's gonna be once it's online. Too, okay. So. All right. Uh, but I'll send you. I'll send you that interview. Okay. That'd be great. That'd be great. That small a, world, huh? Small world. Lovely. Small that's world. that's a great little coincidence. Small awesome. World. It pays to keep this kind of stuff around, doesn't it? Yeah, well, that's archives. I'm an archivist, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, for people who, and certainly I'm no expert here, but, but again, for people who might be watching this, what was the importance of this commission in your report and your findings? Um, that uh, there are certain initiatives that needed to be undertaken to... As, as the title of it says, to ensure a strong and competitive airline industry. Because mm -hmm. they were suffering at the time. Mm -hmm. okay. now they, they bounced back huge. And, and why were they suffering? Um, I don't remember the thing. I mean, they, okay. they were losing money, though. They right, because this was money. 93. This yeah. was only two years after Eastern had to shut down. Mm, yeah. And Eastern had a lot of... Yeah. I mean, some yeah. of that was labor management issues, yeah, right? Yeah, but yeah. But... It has been suggested that, you know, post deregulation yeah, yeah. was something that, that also really hurt Eastern. Yeah. So did that have to do, the de deregulation, did that have to do with the findings? I'd have to... You'd, you'd have to look at it more closely? Yeah, okay. I understand. Again. Okay. Um, and for, for people who are watching the interview, this is called Change, Challenge, and Competition, the National Commission to Ensure a Strong Competitive airline industry in case they want to look it up look uh -huh. up a copy for okay. themselves. Okay. So this is great. Okay. <laughs> Before I started this job, if anybody had told me that I would have even a passing interest in aviation history, mm -hmm. I would have been like, You're crazy. Uh -huh. But <laughs> but this job has just really taken me a, a lot of places and That's great. And I'm sorry to take up time on your um on your interview. But uh because I usually don't do it, but I that just everything kind of coming together. That's so, good. So, no, that's yeah. good. That's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. I did something for you. Yeah. So, um, but you were talking about being on this commission, mm -hmm. and that Mr. McDaniel had recommended you for it, yeah. and um, that's where we were. Okay, let me see. There was something that, that that specifically they asked for that I was able to provide them. Um, I remember that. Let me see. What was it? Um, they wanted something, and I gave it to them. I was able to find it for them. I can't remember now. I can't remember now. I did something. I can't remember now. It's been so long. Oh well. So that was that too. That was a that was that was a good experience too. Um, uh, 
Now, I left the Office of Rulemaking in 1995. If you remember, I mentioned Dave Tuttle. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, he was now he was now a senior executive now. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he had a um, uh, a division in the maintenance side of the house. Okay, airway facilities was called at the time. And he knew I was still trying to find a way to get into the executive ranks, so he uh, offered me a, a division uh, in his organization. Uh, and so I moved from rulemaking and went work for him okay. for a year. Well, it turned out to be a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I found out that really wasn't my cup of tea mm -hmm. inside of the house. And... Um, Someone suggested that I go back to uh, the uh, associate administrator for aviation standards, which rulemaking came under aviation standards at the time, who was uh, Tony Broderick, probably heard that name. When I left rulemaking, he said to me, you know, if you ever need anything, uh, don't hesitate to call on me. Uh, folks say that. You know. But this, this particular kind of case, I said, okay, let me try it. So I went back to Tony and told him, I said, you know, that's not working for me. And uh, he kind of asked me why after we got past that. Then he asked me, um, uh, would I uh, have any issue with my old, doing my old job? I said, no, I just get me out of airway facilities, you know. Well... Chris Christie was still the director of rulemaking. All right. Had they not filled your position in that year that you'd been gone? No, they had not. And, and, I love Chris. Um, I'd run into him maybe four or five months before, and he was he was telling me about they were going to, they had gotten some new space, office space, and they were moving upstairs and so forth and so on. And, he took me up to show me how it was going to be and this, that, and the other. And he then he started lamenting. He said, I've got the this um uh I got to fill this position. They he sent me a list of candidates and stuff. And he said, if you were still here, I wouldn't have to be going through this. You know. That was that. Well, sure enough, after I went to see Tony, in about three days. I got a call. I said, well, go back to your old job. That's Chris Christie. And I went back to my same office. It hadn't been changed. It even had, I don't know if, in, in, if, if, if um, your office has anything like this, but we used to have these little, little cardboard boxes where we put uh, uh, paper that we recycle and use again. Mm -hmm. My little cardboard box was still in the same spot that I left it. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. That was Chris Christie. Brought me back, just like that. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. sincere, really, you know. But we got, we, we, we were such a good team together. And in six months, he retired. Mm -hmm. And I became the director of the office. And he had started, um, he did some really fantastic things. Uh, he had created, he and Tony had been the brain trust behind creating an aviation rulemaking advisory committee. A, 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 a means to... Say that again. Aviation rulemaking advisory committee. Okay. Which was comprised of um, stakeholders in the industry, both in airlines, uh, unions, uh, the public, uh, various stakeholders, to get advice from them on rulemaking regulations that the FAA should consider or was doing and needed changing and so forth and so on. And we had a whole structure. I mean, um, uh, I inherited that from Chris, 
we, we, our office, the office of rulemaking, we were the executive director for it. So we managed all of the communications, we scheduled the meetings, which is a big deal. Oh, that's a big deal because you're using, you, you, you're, you're undertaking actions that affect the public, uh, every aspect of the public, traveling, uh, citizens, uh, the industry, workers, so forth and so on. So uh, they need to have an opportunity. The government system is set up so that there's an opportunity for people to, to participate in the decisions that affect them. That's part of our democracy. And we were experts at this. We were experts at it. Um, and so we managed all of that. You know, you have, you have to provide, put out federal register notices, you have to find a place, you know, a place that can accommodate everyone, that's secure, the whole nine yards. We did all that, okay? And I, we were the executive directors. So when Chris retired, I was the exec, executive director. And so we had those meetings, we did that and, and worked that. But then the process has been accused over time, and still is, of being cumbersome, uh, uh, not user-friendly, and blah, 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 burdensome. Uh, but a lot, of, a lot of ways it's intended to be slow, so as you don't make quick, you know, unthought out uh, uh, or, or less than thought out uh, uh, actions. Um, well, but, but everything can, can, can use some improvement and changes. So we started a project to re-engineer the process. Okay. And... In order to get buy-in on that, this is a briefing that I gave the executive staff to get the decision from the new administrator, Jane Garvey, uh, in 1998 to undertake this. And it came with a slideshow. Was it an actual slideshow or was it a PowerPoint? Had y'all made the transition to PowerPoint? It was PowerPoint. Okay. PowerPoint. Yeah, PowerPoint. And those are the PowerPoint pages you see in there. Oh, Why was this? Why did y'all undertake this? In response to the concerns that have been raised over time about the burdensome aspect of it, uh, to streamline the process, to get more regulations through, mm -hmm. uh, for more efficient use of our resources. Mm -hmm. I've got a chart there that, 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 that will... Uh, capture that captures the, the the problem in one one slide. Let me see if I can find it for you. Six and seven key findings. No. Uh, let me find it for you. It would be the findings. It would be. It would be Now, what you've got there is you've got all the organizations that have rulemaking responsibility. And you see how wide that is. Mm -hmm. And then you got all the support organizations. You see how narrow that is. But each one of these organizations, CARM is one of them, right? Mm -hmm. We have, we, we, we're involved in everything that comes out of all these, these shops, mm -hmm. okay? To, and, and, and the input from all of us, this is uh, policy, that's the economic analysis, general counsel for the legal input, and rulemaking in mm -hmm. terms of the process and, and, and writing, okay? And so then the product then has to work its way to get to top management. There's only a few of them, 
Mm -hmm. But they got all of the stuff that they got to review. Mm -hmm. And finally, this is the phone of it coming out. See how, so you try to force all of this stuff and it gets narrower and narrower mm -hmm. going down. You know, as you go through the process, it gets narrower and narrower in terms of resources in order to get it done. Mm -hmm. But see, if everything was all, was equal, it'd just be a straight down. Right, right. That tells a story. So, were people receptive to this? Yeah. They were? They were. They were. Here, 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 here. You can kind of, I'm going to go use the restroom real quick. I'm you sure. Can walk through and see the receptivity. Somebody was capturing the dynamic of the whole the whole meeting. Jane is the, the administrator. Okay. Here it says on the last page, remarkable piece of work, excited about it. Fits everything we are doing. In a large, because I work for the state, so I experience bureaucracy on some level. I cannot imagine it at the level of the Department of Transportation mm -hmm. at the federal level mm -hmm. or any department at a federal level. Mm -hmm. So, so it had significant lasting changes to the department? Significant lasting. When I went back in 09, mm -hmm. it's still the fundamental the basis of the rulemaking process. Really? Yeah, it is. And as a result of getting... Oh, let me finish your quote. Sure. Get the steering committee rulemaking management council on the process going. This will help form the agenda. This is the high point of my week. And Jane, what's her last name? Uh, Garvey. Garvey. Yeah. That's Jane Garvey. Okay. Jane Garvey. I'm sorry I cut you off. That's okay. That's okay. Awesome. With that buy-in, mm -hmm. okay, this is what we ultimately came up with. I don't know if you notice, but I like colors. Mm -hmm. And I got that from, when I first came to the FAA, there was reference made to the Brown Book. And the Brown Book was um, uh, an air traffic control uh, manual or something. But e e immediately, everyone could, all you had to say was the Brown Book and people know what you're talking about. You'd have to, you didn't have to know this whole title, any of that. Mm -hmm. It's the brown book. So that's the red book. Okay. 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 And then I also have a green book of the uh, Rulemaking Advisory Committee. The green book. Yeah. That's the process for the Rulemaking Advisory Aviation Rulemaking Advisory Committee. Reporting and record keeping. So this even went into enough detail to, to to like to let people in different offices know what they should keep and how they should keep it and what they were responsible for. Yep. That's great. Yep, 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 yep. Yep. Speaking of color, you know, the Code of Federal Regulations is a different color every year. Mm -hmm. And in our government documents department, we would all bet on what color it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> and then when we got the first one and opened it, it was a celebration. Mm hmm Do you mind if I respond to a quick text? Oh, not at all. Okay. Not at all. Got somebody supposed to come see me. I tell them. So, these are still in use? Well, they've got some semblance of that. I don't know about this. Okay. You know, but they definitely have some semblance of that. They still were, they were tweaking that when I uh, was there back in 2009. Uh, mm -hmm. They were still they were upgrading it to mm -hmm. uh, reflect new, new technology and maybe some changes in policy. Mm -hmm. okay. but it's still the, the foundation. Now, are those documents that would have been... Because you have the 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 document you showed me uh, from when you were in the regulatory analysis branch, I know would have been something that would have been widely distributed 
to uh Which show you was a good, good that 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 one. No, this was before that. That was before that. Uh -huh. But something like that would have ended up in all the federal uh, depository libraries around the country. Uh, but with yeah. those other documents, were those for in-house as opposed to yeah. like distribution? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And this is actually at the National Technical Information Service. Okay, the NTIS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one is. Mm -hmm. But that, but that, just looking at the cover of that, I feel like that would have gone to depository libraries. Good. Um, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. But those were more in house for more for like keeping policies and procedures in order within the organization. Yeah. And that was just for the Department of Transportation or just FAA. the FAA. Just the FAA. Just the FAA. Just the FAA. Just the FAA. Mm -hmm. Did um those influence other departments to Yeah. Adapt something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah actually yeah. actually, um, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but when I went to, to the Transportation Security Administration, mm -hmm. it was primarily to help them set up stuff like this. Okay. So your reputation is beyond economist at this point. Oh, yeah. And you've oh, and, yeah. and with all those yeah. years in the rule make, with rulemaking, yeah. oh, that sounds so fascinating. Yeah, it was. I love rules. Yeah. That sounds really <laughs> fascinating to me. Um, that, that really you're known for... For, I don't want to put the words in your mouth, but um, um, uh, process management, um, advisory committee, leadership and management, which is part of the Sunshine Act, uh, economic analysis, regulatory processes, regulatory analysis, yeah. Which is big picture. Yeah, it is. I mean, you have to take in. You have to see a lot of things and understand how they all mm -hmm. work together. Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah. And you really enjoyed it. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I did. Do you like rules too? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it's very, it's, it's very meat and potatoes. You know, it's real. You know, and you have to do it right. Mm -hmm. You have to do it right. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, And I don't know if this is the right time to to do it, but uh, yeah. Uh, what I did mention oh. was was the responsibility to hold and chair public meetings on regulations, both for the Aviation Rulemaking Advisory Committee and when I went to TSA. They had me to chair the Aviation Security Advisory Committee. First, they had me to stand it up. It was the Aviation Security Advisory Committee used to reside as an FAA responsibility when the FAA had aviation security pre-9-11 under its responsibility. When 9-11, as we know, created Homeland Security and the agencies, TSA being the main one initially, Transportation Security Administration, okay, and so ASAC, Aviation Security Advisory Committee, had been kind of dormant for a while, mm -hmm. and once TSA was stood up, they wanted to resurrect it, and I was the resurrector, and um, so I brought my advisory committee experience, knowledge, and chaired, chaired a bunch of meetings, um, organized, and then chaired. And while we're talking about the TSA, because that was 2002 to 2004, that, that wasn't, it was all response. As a, I, I, let me think of a good way to say it. So you weren't sort of observing, like with, like with rulemaking, inefficiencies and in trying to line everything up and make it 
work better for everyone. You were responding to a crisis and you were trying to, would you say that with a setup of TSA that you were, you know, in it, because it was set up in response to September 11th. E and, and there's this, um, is that how it felt or it seemed, as an outsider, it seems mm -hmm. like you have all of these people hurrying with all of these resources to get something set up that provides protection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. the goal. Yeah. But this panic after after mm -hmm. September 11th, did, mm -hmm. did it feel that way kind of going? I mean, we... Mm -hmm. I know you, but you started talking about it. So while we're there, I like that's. I'm yeah. curious about that. Well, I'm, do you understand what I'm asking? Like, it's, in order to be responsive, mm -hmm. you have to put in place infrastructure. Okay. This is this was about putting in place the infrastructure to enable effective responsiveness. Mm -hmm. So for the TSA, for example, would you say it wasn't there? It wasn't there at all. No, because they did. It couldn't have been there. Right. Okay. So we were creating. Okay. And I had the expertise in these areas to mm -hmm. enable to to do the creating, mm -hmm. and in many cases the executing. Mm -hmm. um, the advisory committee was a was a a, um, a resurrection, and then execution. Okay, and um, uh, advisory committee meeting is a um, uh, is a public meeting, which with 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 transcripts. Okay. A public meeting with the general public. Yes. Whoever wanted to come. Yeah. And they could weigh in and ask questions or or were they observance only? Well, this was they they could observe because the the, the advisory committee, this is an advisory committee meeting. Mm -hmm. So it's the advisory committees who, who the members who participate and the public uh, uh, to the extent that there's room and uh, and reflective of the level of interest uh, could allow questions. I mean, there's some, some there were some meetings where uh, we took public questions, but they, uh, let me see, this was, this is more of an AVAC meeting, I'm trying to think back. No, actually, I'm kind of getting, I'm getting things a little bit crossed here. Uh, um, They were public meetings to the extent that 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 the public could attend, but they really weren't participants. Okay. Okay. They okay. were there to listen. These kinds of meetings. Mm -hmm. Now there are regulatory meetings uh, where there might be a public meeting held in response to a uh, uh, a notice of proposed rulemaking. And you want to have a panel discussion so the public can hear. There might be a, um, a microphone set aside. If someone has a question or a point they want to make, they can be asked to be recognized, mm -hmm. sent to the microphone, and, and, and become part of the public record with their input. So it depends on mm -hmm. the circumstances. Most of these were, were getting the advisory committee running again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, getting focus on certain things. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a rulemaking. Uh, I forget what it was about. It's been so long now. Uh, that uh, um, uh, we were really, really pushing to do. In fact, if you allow me, mm -hmm. if this was my last order of business too. Um, <laughs> We're going to go back and cover the stuff we missed, but just because you started talking about it, I wanted to... Yeah. Um, this is the transcript from, from a meeting. The, my last day on the job, September 30th, 2004. That's a tall order for a last day of work. Okay. Is that yeah. all you did all day? Was Yeah, that's all I did all day. Mm. Okay. Um, the, the subject, what was the subject? It was something to do with, um, what was the issue? What was the issue? It was some kind of program for, what was that program for? 
thing was securing air cargo. But that was a that's a, a soft spot in the aviation security uh, pro, um, uh, regime is cargo. Uh, we would take passenger flights well, but cargo flights were still needing some enhancement. Mm -hmm. So we had constituents in, and 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 their principles. In order to, we had uh, a, a working group made up of uh, uh, stakeholders, okay? And most of the time when you have a working group, you know, you have, you have uh, uh, conflicting, competing views mm -hmm. and interests and passions and so forth and so on, okay? But the, 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 the principles, though, that, that, that enable this process to be effective, one of which is you maintain confidentiality of what we're working on. You don't leak stuff to the press. You don't do that kind of thing because then you you, you kill the 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 the, uh, the, um, uh, the spirit of the intent. Well, the product that was to come out uh, for this meeting got leaked. Okay, and we had our suspicions of who leaked it. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but you know we wouldn't air that in, in, in the public. But if I felt it needed to be spoken to, um, so in my opening remarks, beginning here on page eight, if you'll give me a minute or two. Yeah. Of course. It says, okay, so it's stated in the current ASEC charter. ASEC's mission is to examine areas of civil aviation security as tasked by TSA with the aim of developing recommendations for the improvement of civil aviation security methods, equipment, and procedures. So what is not specifically stated in this recent statement, however, is how we go about doing this business. The ideal for a process such as this is to build consensus everywhere possible. If the consensus is not always achievable, the goal should always be to capture the full essence of all the diverse views and package them in a way that provides the agency with the best opportunity for understanding and integrating that diversity. There are certain expectations that participants bring Give me on the film. <laughs> Tear this thing up. To bring such as hard work, cooperation, teamwork, respect, dignity, and not the least of which, honor. There was also an expect expectation of a shared commitment to the principles of confidentiality and to a grievance made either in writing or in spirit. Or agreements to be made given and for agreements to be made either in writing or in spirit. I want to say that 99% of those engaged in this process, both the public and government, have been exemplary in how you have performed and how you have conducted yourselves. And we applaud and commend you for that. There remains, however, a 1% that continues to struggle with the choice of either remaining true to the values and principles that are essential to the, to the success of this process versus seizing upon any perceived opportunity to advance their particular causes or interests at any cost and without regard to ASAC values and principles. As you all know, there was a serious breach in confidentiality and protection of sensitive information. I got this thing over here. I can't read. How did I get it on there in the first place? Mm -hmm. Okay, here it comes. All right. So there was a breach 
As you know, there was a serious breach in confidentiality and protection of sensitive security information at the end of the cargo effort last year. The breach was sufficiently egregious and disturbing that it led several members of ASAC or TSA to launch a full-scale federal investigation to identify the offenders. Valuable time was lost while the agency sorted through the situation and determined the action that it would take. It would be inappropriate to go into any details here, but I will say that the misconduct of the small minority places a serious burden on everyone involved in the process to find and adopt measures that will protect the process and the 99% of you who perform and give admirably of yourselves when called upon. To the 1%, I'll simply say that each person has his own conscience to deal with. You have yours. As for the agency, the TSA is committed to ASAC in its mission and will continue to work with confidence with the 99% to solve serious aviation security problems in a manner that ensures the integrity of the process and that protects the participant. TSA will continue, will also continue to look forward to the time when the 99% becomes 100%. That was my statement. Was it ever made public who the person or people were? Nah, nah, but we had our suspicions. We're, we never, it was never made public. Were they asked to recuse themselves from the committee? Well, you'd have to identify them. Oh, okay. So y'all, like even internally, yeah. 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 it wasn't known. No. It wasn't known for sure. Right. But we had our suspicions, you know. And I felt I had to speak to that, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, how was that received? Uh, a couple people walked up to me afterwards and um, said they're glad I said something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, but then I was gone. <laughs> after that, after I was gone. Right, right. Okay. I was gone. Okay. <laughs> you know, I was gone. But geez, I kept the, kept, I kept this. That was 14 years, 13 years ago. So when you have a public meeting and, and members of the general public do come out to weigh in on issues, is there a way to kind of, you know, I know that there are a lot of folks who might show up with like very earnest motivations but you must also get yeah. people who yeah. Yeah. I mean yeah. how do you manage that in such a big crowd well I had to learn you know you get burnt I got burnt early on uh, when I first uh, was doing meetings this was in the 90s but after that you know I was okay uh, what I would do if someone started down a road, down a track that uh, was inappropriate or I felt needed correcting, I would tell the uh, court reporter, stop for a moment. I would invite them, the person, to, to, to the podium, put the mic down, and I'd just talk to them straight. And I would say something along the lines like, no, we're very, we like to, um, I know you have something you want. That, that you like to contribute and we like to hear it. But this is how you ha you'll need to do that. Now, do you think you can do that? Mm -hmm. If they say, yeah, okay, then that's what I expect you to do. Now let them continue to speak. They usually comply. But that's what it would take. Mm -hmm. And once you, you establish something like that, you're usually okay. Right. And nobody else hears it. Right, right. I mean, did you ever have any, I can only imagine conspiracy theorists show up. Uh, none that I can think of, okay. but I'm sure they were there. Right. But I think though, after you know, you do do a few of these, and you get to know the people. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they know they don't have to deal with you again. Mm -hmm. You know, it 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 kind of works its way, works itself out. And were there people who came in and had questions or observations or concerns that made you go, oh, well, we hadn't really thought of it that way. I mean, were, were, were there people that ever contributed and maybe provided mm -hmm. a point of view that y'all hadn't considered? Mm -hmm. And that would be in the record. Okay. We, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily address it and say, oh, aha, uh -huh, yeah, at the beginning. <laughs> right, of course. <laughs> you know, you, you kind of write it down yeah. and then you go back uh -huh. and you review it. Uh -huh. You know, okay. you, in, 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 in those cases, we're basically there to listen. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
so we're not really giving, uh, um, we're not engaging in an exchange mm -hmm. per se. This is an opportunity for okay. you public to provide the agency with information. What do you think compels people to show up at one of these meetings? Like, because a lot of people have a lot of opinions, but only a small number will actually yeah. come. Um, I would only, I would I would believe that it in most cases a general concern to know or, or to get more informed or to to um, uh, be helpful if they can. You're always going to have some small fraction that, that will want their five minutes of fame. Or, or to appear and be seen by colleagues or whatever, but it, most of, I, 99 percent of the conference, 99 percent of the time, they're, they're legitimate participation mm -hmm. uh, to try to solve problems, and that, and that, and that's what keeps you engaged and committed mm -hmm. uh, because it's worthwhile and and and, and uh, people want to. Get a feel for the government and what's going on, you know, and you owe it to them. You really do. Uh, that was a good part about it, too, that you're able to do something that, that's really meaningful and people know that it's meaningful. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they'll, hold you, they'll hold you accountable, too. Mm -hmm. if, you're, uh, if you're not uh, uh, on top of things as you should be. And this advisory committee uh, skill, I mean, you're absolutely right. Okay, my, my training education is economics, but through the experience, uh, I've mastered a pretty sizable skill set. Um, and managing a committee like that, I mean, you can't, you have to really know what you're doing in the moment. You don't have time to figure it out in the moment. Right. You have to know. And how many people were on the committee? Uh... And, and usually committees are made up of the people, but they're really organizations. Mm -hmm. and so they're representing an organization. Mm -hmm. So a ARAC, the roommate committee, it was about 50 or so. And then you have probably the same similar number for security too because a lot of them were the same people. Just different topic. Mm -hmm. ARAC was mostly operation stuff. ASAC was security stuff. Mm -hmm. It was the same uh, uh, group of players in mm -hmm. a lot of respects, mm -hmm. and and it was all across from all across the yeah the federal Structure. government. No, this is industry. Oh, industry. This is okay, industry. okay. And these are industry groups. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. These are industry groups. Yeah. So this is these are FAA um, committees uh, in, that include. Uh, those constituencies affected by FAA regulations or TSA regulations. Aviation, aerospace, airports. Yeah, right. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. okay. Um, and you, you said earlier that the Aviation Security Advisory Committee, ASAC, that maybe it had been in existence for a while, but maybe hadn't been... Functioning. Functioning. Mm -hmm. What do you know about when it was started and why, and then maybe why it ceased to? Uh, I know I had that somewhere. I can't think of it right off. I know I had that somewhere. Okay. Um, um, I know we started a rack in ninety one. Mm -hmm. uh, a sack. Somewhere thereabouts, a couple of years or two. It might have been. It might have been. I think ASAC might have come before ARAC because I think ASAC was in response to uh, Pan Am One Hundred and Three, which was eighty nine. That's the bomb plane blew up in the sky. You said bomb. Other people would tell you. Other some people might tell you. That was the group of, like, it had all the stu French students going on a, it was headed to France? No, nah, this was a, this was a commercial. Maybe I'm thinking about United mm. 800. 
Ah, okay. Was that uh, that was the fuel tank, I think. Okay. The fuel tank. Yeah, I think that was the fuel tank one. Now this was the bomb. It's a Pan Am 103. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think Bin Laden. I kind of took credit for it. I think. I think he took credit for it. But I think that's around the time when ASAC came on. I think. I mm -hmm. think. Okay. And but the last few years before. 9-11 uh, hadn't been too active, hadn't been active, mm -hmm. and so they resurrected it, TSA resurrected it. Mm -hmm. That was my, probably my first task. Yeah. Yeah, I started working for TSA in August of 02, and I think we had, we put together a meeting in October of 02, and I put together a meeting by then. So it didn't take, take long. Mm -mm. But that's because I had the expertise. I got to figure out what to do. It's a really big title. Deputy Associate Undersecretary. Mm -hmm. Deputy slash Deputy Assistant Administrator for Analysis and Eternal. External? Internal. External. External. But, here, but here's okay. the thing. That, that, that reflects... At first, TSA was under DOT. So positions were under secretaries. Mm -hmm. Then once Homeland was established, okay. TSC, TSA became an agency under Homeland. Mm -hmm. So now you've got assistant administrators, mm -hmm. administrators and assistant administrators. So that's why. So I was a deputy assistant administrator. And you know, the general public really knows TSA from the workers in airports. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, What else was is the TSA responsible for? Uh, railroad security. Um, um, waterway security. All transportation security. Mm -hmm. uh, but but airports is the aviation is the primary. Mm -hmm. But because it's. Is it that because it's mostly used by the general public mm -hmm. more than the other? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And that's where, obviously, the, the, the top, that, that was a target. Mm -hmm. um, uh, target, the favorite target of choice by terrorists. Do you think it, it has an unfair reputation as being... Uh, and maybe not the the spirit of the work, the spirit of its intent, but the implementation. Do you think it gets an unfair reputation? Mm, I have a lot of problems. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, you don't feel comfortable talking no, about. I don't want to talk about that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I, talk I got about it. That. Okay. A lot of challenges. Um, so then let's step back for a minute. When you were in the Office of Rulemaking, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you showed me the, the manual, the red and the green, mm -hmm. um, w did any of the work you did as part of that office lead to significant changes in the Code of Federal regulations, or 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 was it just internal? Oh yeah. Well, the role that we play in this diagram here. Mm -hmm. um, I where it was. Um, Rule we played in this diagram. Mm -hmm. Everything that comes out of here, okay, goes in the Code of Federal Regulations. Okay. So it made it easier to get changes. But were there significant I guess that I guess the outcome 
it was getting it done more than what the outcome was. Yes. Yes. You're getting it done. Okay. You're getting it done. Okay. Right. You're getting getting the products done. Okay. To facilitate more effectively the the um, accomplishment of issuing regulations. And you were director from eighty from ninety seven to ninety nine. I was deputy from ninety from eighty nine to ninety five. Um, and then in ninety nine, you became the deputy associate administrator for commercial and space aviation commercial transportation. Mm -hmm. um, can we take a break? Yep. Do you mind? Yep. So we are picking back up where we left off. We were just about to talk about, in 99, you became Deputy Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation. Okay. And so what is that for people watching who might not uh, know? It's the uh, uh, launching of... Um, space travel uh, by commercial entities. Mm -hmm. um, historically, that's been just a government in, uh, uh, enterprise, uh, but it's expanding, there's a process of expanding to uh, um, uh, more commercial uh, um, functioning, and uh, it includes commercial launches of satellites as an industry uh, using uh, commercial uh, rocket vehicles for that purpose. And the office was responsible for setting the uh, safety requirements and ensuring a safe launch mm -hmm. of, of, of uh, uh, commercial uh, spacecraft. So why did it fall under the FAA and not under NASA? Um, because it's transportation. It's uh, it's, it's commercial. NASA is all government. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it it uh, it had been part of uh, uh, DOT and then was moved to the FAA. Okay. So it started out as part of DOT. That's my understanding. Mm -hmm. um, there there is um, uh, you know, sharing of knowledge and technology, but Old admissions are different. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the current, uh, I don't know if you follow uh, SpaceX. I know a little about it. Yeah. Um, NASA had retired the, the shuttle, mm -hmm. which was its reusable launch vehicle. What I didn't know until I got into that uh, uh, organization was that the, v the rockets, the vehicles used to launch satellites, put satellites up one time. Mm -hmm. they, they launch, the satellite goes off, the vehicle goes into the ocean, that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. Okay, a lot of money. Okay, now. The, 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 the um, uh, shuttle was the only reusable launch vehicle. The shuttle would go up in space and come back. Mm -hmm. okay. One of the responsibilities of that organization was to develop the um, uh, necessary regulations, processes, procedures, security measures, safety measures for commercial reusable launch and return. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, finish, but then I've got a and question. That, and that would include um, passenger tour flights and that kind of thing, or passenger flights to the space station for tourism or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. And, and also, <clears throat> to provide NASA with an alternative to be able to buy reusable launch services 
from a commercial entity. So then they wouldn't have to maintain as a government agency that type of capability. Mm -hmm. Okay. Although it, it does it because it sends actually it buys that service uh, for its astronauts from the Russians. Most of the, the going up there now, mm -hmm. coming back here, they don't rest in vehicles. Many of them are, they don't rest in Russian rockets. Right. Right. I'm surprised, very surprised to hear that. In that arena, there's a great amount of cooperation. Okay. There's a great amount of cooperation. They're, the, they're scientists, you know. Mm -hmm. they're, up, they're sharing information. They are working together in, in that environment, okay. And the U.S. hasn't been maintaining that, that um, uh, uh, fleet of vehicles like it once had. If I'm if I'm if I'm keeping up with it right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So how practical is it or how soon do you think it'll be or how much work has been done on getting just civilians into space for For tourist purposes? Yeah, mostly for tourist purposes. Well, I mean, what's the practicality? I mean, is that has that hasn't actually happened yet, has it? Um. Or maybe I don't remember. I know well, people have talked about it. No, it hasn't become. It hasn't. Um, human flights, commercial space flight, hasn't been uh, approved yet. But they're working on it, and space is considered the next frontier. So it's going to happen somewhere along the way, mm -hmm. and it's getting closer and closer. Uh, I think it was years ago you had this series of uh, SpaceX uh, um, disasters or, or failures. So that sets back mm -hmm. the notion of flying people. Mm -hmm. But you got people who signed up for it. And they're just waiting for when it's when it's feasible. Right. You know, I think it's three hundred thousand dollars a flight now. I think to do that yeah. for a person. Hmm. But people have signed up for it. What was your day to day work like in that position? Oh. Uh, Well, I was the regulatory person for that, too. Um, mainly communicating with uh, the aviation side of the house, trying to facilitate uh, a common ground where, where we had it, uh, mainly to, to get um, uh, support for and insights and knowledge for establishing the um, protocols for reusable spacecraft to uh, navigate the airspace. Okay. Um, there was just everything around that. And you were only there for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. But while you were there, and I brought, I guess I brought it up earlier, but while you were there, the September 11th attacks happened. Yeah, it did. It did. How did that affect your work at the FAA? Uh, what was the response like? Yeah. Um, what did we do? Cause see, I was gone by. What did we do? I don't know. We had a lot to do in commercial space. 
Uh, we had, as part of the FAA management structure, we we had to um, uh, um, practice response in the event of a, some sort of terrorist act, that kind of thing. But specifically to our mission in commercial space, I don't recall. I don't recall anything we had to do. I don't like the airplane side. Mm -hmm. I don't recall anything that we had to do. So it was it was almost business as usual. Mm -hmm. Okay. Almost as usual, yeah. I don't recall anything. Okay. But then you were asked, um, to well I assume you were asked to move into the position of Deputy Associate uh, Undersecretary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The TSA? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, did, how did those, you, you seem to really enjoy being in the Office of Rulemaking. Mm -hmm. How did those jobs compare to rulemaking for you personally? Oh, uh, no comparison. No comparison? No comparison. No, I, it it was it was good that I was near the end of my career. They both of those sped up my retirement. Yeah. Yeah, both of them did. Yeah. I had, had most of the fun I had, had by then. Um, as it turns out, I mean, had some fun along the way at TSA a little bit, but fundamentally. It wasn't a place that uh, I had any great memories for, mm. you know. It wasn't as fulfilling, maybe? Um, well, um, this was so fulfilling the word, yeah, that may be. I mean, I was busy enough and I accomplished some things. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the best environment, mm. you know. Yeah, it wasn't the best environment, so I was glad to get away. Well, there's information here about different um, awards and things, mm -hmm. and other activities outside of work. Is there anything else about work that you'd like to say that I haven't asked you about, or? I like my boss at TSA. His name was Tom Blank. Blank? Mm -hmm. yeah, I liked him. And I had a pretty decent staff too. Uh, but there was there were one of the problems with TSA was um you had a lot of folks who were and this is just my opinion, okay, who were in in high level position, positions, they really weren't competent. They had what I would call the hookup, okay, and it reflected. It showed. It showed in every aspect of the organization. Um, uh, and up to that point, up to that point, I never had in my in career that I can recall uh, 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 noticeable disrespect. That I had to push back on, you know, and I did. Um, um, and I just attributed to some of the culture from where they came from, you know. Uh, and it reflected on, I believe, one of the main reasons why the, the organization never really um, reached a level of um, respectability. 
that uh, you would um, expect or, or like to see. Um, and it's still struggling. It's still struggling. It's been, I've been out of there since 04. You know. Uh, so, I don't know what ever happened with that agency. FA was a good agency. Good agency. Good agency. FA was a good agency. Yep. I had great times with the FAA. Um, the only thing, like I said, uh, um, 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 it did take me a while to get over that hump. You know, but uh, other than that, I mean, I have to balance that against how quick I got to the 15. It was quick. Mm -hmm. you know, some people, people never get to that. And that's what I kept reminding myself. Some folks never will, be, never will get to this. I'm already here. The fact that I've been here for a while, well, you know, that's, maybe this is the journey I have to go. And that's how I looked at it. That's how it turned out, you know. Uh, but all in all, the FAA, I, I, was, I enjoyed the FAA. Um, I had some folk that, that uh, uh, actually did look out for me. different ways. Uh, when you look at uh, when I was working on a degree, uh, when I left the organization and then was able to come back. But those aren't small things, mm -hmm. you know? They really aren't. Um, and uh, I want to acknowledge that, you know? Mm -hmm. So the first award that you have here the Associate, Associate Administrator Special Achievement Award from 95. So that would have been when you were Deputy Director? Yeah. 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 And what was your special achievement? <laughs> I wish I could remember. <laughs> Probably something to do with the process. Something to do with uh, getting regs out or something. I can't remember specific. I'm sorry, I can't remember specific. And then you received the Administrator of Transportation Security Administrator Honor Award. Yeah, I think that's that one. Okay. Uh, I was just, I mean, I did so much in terms of standing up mm -hmm. the functions at TSA. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think it's the next one is that one. One of the, one, those two. The, the TSA awards. Those okay. two medals. Yeah, because the other one is the Office of Transportation Security Policy Honor Award. Is that yeah. the other one? Yeah, yeah. Those are all the medals. That's, I can see that, so, that says, oh, well, they're both honor awards. Yeah. Those are when I was going out the door, too, I think. Uh. <laughs> <sighs> The Howard University Economic Alumni Association Distinguished Alumni Award in 2005. Uh -huh. Is that in here? That's upstairs. Yeah, that's upstairs. And the Pi Alpha Alpha Alpha? Pi Alpha Alpha? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Honor Society for Public Administration. Yeah, I was inducted into that um, based on my DPA mm -hmm. through the uh, Public Administration degree program mm -hmm. at GW. We never talked about that. Uh, we, we never... Didn't talk about no, because you had, you had all those great stories related to your Master of Arts at Georgetown. Yeah. I think we never really talked about... Okay. I think we talked about the other three. Okay. Um, do you want to take a minute and talk about sure. why you wanted to get a Master of Public, Public Administration? Well, first of all, it was an opportunity. It's not. It was an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I was there. Mm -hmm. um, um, I didn't have to. I did. I did. I didn't. I, I did not take a single course on George Washington's campus. All that was done in the same facility as I did the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. Okay. They all. They all came to a DW. Okay. Great professors. Mm -hmm. I still. I'm still good friends with the. Uh, 
chairperson, great person. Uh, she's actually mentored my daughter through her PhD. Really? At the GW. Yeah, so that's been a great relationship. Mm -hmm. It goes back that far. And my, my daughter's getting the benefit from that relationship. Mm -hmm. Good people. Mm -hmm. Good people. Yeah, that, um, uh, that, was, that was a good experience. Yeah, that was, see, that, that, the no degree is an easy degree, but it was, um, I didn't have to balance work, I could just be a student. Mm -hmm. That was the good part about that, I was just a student. And by then, you know, I mean, I'm disciplined in my life, so, uh, um, I had close to a 4.0. Mm. And of course, the Master of Public Administration would benefit you when you got to the Office of Rulemaking. Anywhere. In anywhere. Anywhere. Yeah. Anywhere in the government. Anywhere in the government. Mm. Yeah. Anywhere in the government. Yep. Anywhere in the government. And the last award listed here is is um, or no, the last thing listed here is a president of the Howard University Economic Alumni Association. Yeah. So what does that group do? Uh, it supports the economic department in Howard University, mm -hmm. um, as well as uh, the students um, in economics. Uh, done a lot. They've done a lot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a, uh, a travel award that, that, that they give for students to go and attend. One student to go and attend. The National Economic Association meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, there's um, uh, some some sort of scholarship to help with their books. Small group, but but it's like an extension of the department mm -hmm. in terms of uh, like a booster club in a sense, but mm -hmm. more than that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, had some it has a. It also supports the uh, uh, economic uh, department, um, Honor Society, which is the Omnicron Epsilon something. Um, and two scholarships, uh, uh, um, 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 What's the word? Uh, endowment. Endowed two scholarships um, in honor of two former professors, both deceased. So we have fundraisers to uh, get them funded and then dispense scholarship money um, under certain criteria to students. Uh, they've been around since 01, 02. I haven't been active in the last few years, but uh, I was president from 07 to 09, I think. What was it? What did I say? 07 to 09. 07 mm -hmm. 09. Mm -hmm. Vice president, 05, 05 to 07. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think they, they made me distinguish I'm not 05, I think. There's something else I was going to I had a thought. No, don't apologize. Uh, oh, I don't know. This is Jermaine Wall, but I was, as I was looking through stuff together for this meeting, I came across uh, something that uh, I guess I'm kind of kind of proud of. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here's something else I wanted to say.
current man or something. Uh, yeah, 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 there's a couple things I wanted to say. Um, uh, I was able to mentor uh, one of my secretaries to develop into a professional analyst and I developed a competency continuum for a professional analyst which kind of captured the attributes and skills that, that should be reflected at each level of progression. I got a copy of that somewhere. Um, and I enhanced and elevated the competencies and capabilities for the regulatory analysts and rulemaking that justified raising the senior analyst position from a GS-13 to GS-14. And I facilitated the hiring and advancement of fellow economists and regulatory analysts. Uh, and then on a personal note, I did not read the GS-15 at the age of 33. Okay. Uh, oh. So I was looking at this, and, and um, did, so this is your leadership philosophy. There are 15 points. Mm -hmm. I like number six because it says expect employees to recommend a solution for every problem they identify. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise they're just complaining. And along with that, companion of that is uh, never complain down. You don't complain, always complain up. Mm -hmm. So were these just what you learned over the years? Your personal experience? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah basically. Basically, they put it down, articulate it, refer to it. Mm -hmm. Develop successors. Right, develop successors. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's that's about it for me. There's nothing else. We got four hours worth. <laughs> we got a lot, definitely. It's like right at three hours. We took a little break. Yeah, we did. Um, and I guess I just want to point out because we can see them on the film, and so we can see your degrees on the wall of your desk. Oh, okay. Behind you. Um, on the left is the one from Howard University. On the right is the one from George Washington. And in the middle, the one from Georgetown, the one that you thought might never happen. Yeah, that's one. That's yeah. exactly way to put it. Yeah, that's the way to put it. Yeah. Well, I thought it might never happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, if you uh, were there, any other people or any other things or events or work or anything that you wanted to? Yeah, this is my opportunity. I try to write stuff down. I think I got. I got, I got it all. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I pleasure. really, I really appreciate uh, that I was able to come here and talk to you about uh, what I think is a fascinating career, and I'm glad that we have the story to share uh, with everybody who will visit the archives or visit our webpage. Mm. So. I hope it proves useful for someone. Yeah, definitely, definitely. All right. Thanks. Okay. So we are back for one final remembrance. Yes. Um, my Air Force experience. Um, I did my Air Force service at the um, uh, Andrews Air Force Base uh, back in 72, uh, from 72 to 73. And my position, my responsibility, I was the firing range officer uh, where I was um, 
responsible for the training of airmen who were transitioning uh, to um, Overseas duty, uh, the Office of uh, Special Investigation Agents, and the uh, uh, Air Police. And um, I had a great boss. Uh, his name was um, uh, Ed Hannell. He was the first lieutenant, I was the second lieutenant. We were both uh, very young at the time, uh, a great rapport, and he, we became. And once I service, even though I left the service before he did, uh, uh, we've become lifelong friends. I actually saw him. He was here visiting or on a job, on, his, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an assignment from, from Hawaii. He's an attorney uh, for the Department of Defense still. And uh, so we, we stay in touch. It's been over 40 years. Uh, that's a, a bond that uh, veterans will understand and appreciate. But that was a great, great time. It was a short period in my uh, professional history, but it was a very enjoyable and memorable one. And I want to take an opportunity to uh, uh, acknowledge that experience and to recognize uh, the positive influence that 